So keep it, keep. Uh, ah. <laughs> Damn it! Almost had it. Oh, we were doing oh. so good. I know. Oh, man, that was almost a no hitter. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm Chris, a gearhead here with Competitive Cyclist, and we're here with Hannah Otto. She's in the studio to talk about her upcoming FKT attempt of the whole enchilada. Are you excited? I'm super stoked. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Can you tell us a little bit of high level about what your goals are and A, what does FKT stand for for those people might, that might not know that, or like what's the whole enchilada? Yeah, the whole enchilada is probably one of the world's most famous trails, but most people only know it for the descent. So it's about 26 miles downhill with almost 8,000 feet of descending. But I'm not only going to do that, I'm also going to climb up the fire road to start. Badass. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I think the most exciting thing about this for me is it combines all skill sets of mountain biking, which is what I love about mountain biking. There's always a different place that you can be improving or cutting off time, and that's what I hope to do, have the fastest known time for this trail. That's awesome, and as you know, like, it's all a mental game, but also you need to be prepared from a physical and a gear standpoint. Um, tell us a little bit about the bike that you're planning to use for this attempt, and why did you choose it? Yeah, like I said, this is a really unique type of attempt, because while most people on the downhill of the Hohenschlade might ride an enduro bike, and the uphill, you might ride a hardtail, doing both, I'm gonna have to find the perfect in-between. So I'll be riding a Pivot Mach 4 SL, and I'm gonna do that with a 120 millimeter fork in the front, that's a Fox Stepcast 34, and then 100 millimeters in the rear. Wow, have you ridden the, the down a good bit before, and what bike were you on in the past? And have you ridden it on a shorter travel bike like this? Are you excited or nervous? Or? <laughs> I'll admit that's probably the thing I'm most nervous about. I've, like I've said, I've only ridden the down on an enduro bike before, so I've ridden it on the Firebird before. So that's a huge difference. You can basically just close your eyes and tromp through anything on that bike. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to have to be a lot more picky and manage my equipment a lot better because another thing you see on the whole enchilada is people having a lot of issues, both body uh, injuries, crashes, and mechanicals. Totally. I feel like that was the one thing I thought of when I heard XC bike. I was like, what's your tire choice? Because the one thing that you're in a group of like four or five people, guaranteed you're going to have a flat, like most likely throughout the day on the whole enchilada. I've dealt with it. I know a lot of friends have dealt with it. So, you know, your mental capacity to just have to focus on your line choice just for flat prevention alone is going to be huge. Absolutely. And I'm going to ride the Kenda Booster 2.4 tire in the front and the rear. And that should be quite fast and light for the climb, but just allow me a little bit of extra forgiveness on the descent. Um, and I will have a push court in the rear. Good call, good call. What tire pressure are you gonna run? That's probably gonna be a game time decision when I get out there and when I start to feel it and do some of the pre-rides, but I would guess around 17, 18. Uh, the one interesting fact for that is it's gonna heat up throughout the day and I'm gonna be going up in elevation a lot. So I might actually start a little bit lower in anticipation of that rise. Good call. In terms of how you have your bike set up, is it mostly set up from the factory like this from Pivot or is everything pretty customized, like different wheels specific for this or like what have you changed out? A lot of it is pretty spec for Pivot, but like I said, I have the 34 on there. I'm running, um, I'm running a very XC type of wheel, but I have a lot of confidence in what DT Swiss makes that it can withstand this type of um, aggressive descending. So I'm going to be running a DT Swiss XRC 1200 carbon wheel. And then I've got Shimano XTR. I've got a 32 in the front, 1051 in the rear, and then I have a stages power meter on my crank to measure the effort. Nice. Are you more concerned about weight or durability with something like this? I think it's kind of the Goldilocks paradox. It has to be perfectly in the middle. In terms of your suspension, it seems like you have a lockout on both the fork and the rear shock. So probably gonna lock them out for the climb up. Yeah, and I think that's one really good thing about the lockout is I think this trail in particular is gonna be fully closed and fully open. I think mm -hmm. on that descent, there's not gonna be a lot of jostling in between. So that lockout will give me the ability to just set it and forget it on the climb. And then once I get the top, I think that'll actually kind of be a fun mental switch to click as well. Cause when I click it mentally, yeah, like, now I'm all of a sudden down. I'm in descending mode. Yeah. And are you adjusting your sag? Or are you gonna keep the same sag percentage as like 
just so your bike feels normal how you normally ride it and you're comfortable on it or are you gonna like stiffen it up or soften it for the tech or any insight there i think i'll keep it probably pretty standard for me awesome um so jumping away from your bike and more into you and what it takes to prepare physically starting with food um what does run us through like the day before how you prep um for this ride do you carbo load do you eat really like fresh food or do you try to like get a lot of calories in before and then just keep it consistent throughout the day of what's your kind of run a show there with food yeah, I think the most important thing for big efforts like this is to never dip into your glycogen storage into the days leading up. And so even though I'll continue training, even though I'll be looking at the, the route and doing lots of hard rides still, I'm going to make sure that I'm constantly topping off with lots of glycogen. So that's where people might call it carbo loading, but to me it's just making sure that everything is at the maximum that it can be with lots of good and you get a full simple tank. carbohydrates, exactly. Nice, and how are you planning to carry uh, nutrition on the ride? Yeah, I'm gonna have um, fluids in my Usway pack along with some flat pre prevention items. Um, and then I'll actually have all of my food in my back pocket for super easy access because if it's not easy to reach, it's the first thing you just forget. And then with that food, I'll be aiming for about 80 grams of carbohydrates per hour throughout the whole attempt. Awesome. Um, and yeah, well, how much water are you planning to bring from like a liter standpoint? Yeah, I think I'm going to bring at least two liters, if not two and a half. It's okay. still something I'm playing with because like I said, I want to keep it light, but that'll probably be determined based on how hot it is on totally. the day. And I, when I'm thinking about this, I'm like, okay, maybe I would like try to drink the most of my water on the climb up, and that way I have le less weight for the way down, and you're hydrated, and you don't have to think about like, you know, drinking yeah, on the way down. But when it's so the dry, way up is where you don't want the weight. True. <laughs> so you're just gonna drink it all in the first mile, and then you have to stop and pee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so in terms of your backpack and carrying things like water mm -hmm. and food. You mentioned a couple tools. You have a CO2 with an adapter. Mm -hmm. Are you going to have a tube or a multi-tool or anything? Yes, I'll have a multi-tool and a tube in my saddlebag on my cool. bike. Um, and I'll keep that there because if I'm having to stop to change a tube, it's going to be a little slower anyways. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to have a Stan's dart in my back in my in my pack so that it's pretty easily accessible so that hopefully I can catch it before it turns into anything more casual. Totally. And in terms of um, like a mechanical, like say, I guess a chain break or a flat, do you think that could like ruin the attempt or how are you prepared for that mentally? Yeah, um, so I'll have my Stages M200 dash and it will be on continuous. So there will be no pausing. So if I have any issues, time continues to run. Um, but the good news for a trail like this is I think Honestly, anyone who ever attempts this will have some issue or another. Mm -hmm. So it's all going to be about staying calm, managing those issues, and not about how long it takes, but just trying to make that a little bit shorter. And similar to self-supported enduro races, like you're not allowed to have help. You got to fix your stuff and just keep going. Yeah. And that's just part of the game. Yeah. And it's all about staying calm because the second you start to panic is when you miss things and make more mistakes. And that's when it can become a catastrophic uh and at the end of the day. Sweet. Well, getting into it, you mentioned your stages and briefly mentioned your power meter. Um, you want to run us through which ones you're using and um, how they kind of help you track your day and um, dive into them a little bit more. Yeah, so I will be using the Stages Dash M200 along with a Stages double-sided power meter to measure my power, my time, my distance, which are all really big things I'm going to be looking at. Time, because it's the fastest known time. I want to know how fast I'm going. Mm -hmm. Distance, because it's going to be a really long time. There are yeah. going to be times out there where I'm like, when is this going to end? Mm -hmm. And I'm literally going to be counting down, you know, the points of a mile. Totally. And so I think I might actually have distance to end on this so that it's counting down. Nice. Um, and then that climb, it's going to be several hours long. Mm -hmm. And so pacing, especially at the start, since it's not a race, since it's just me, and I'm really nervous and excited, I'm going to want to definitely look at my power so that I pace myself Yeah, well. not just drain your battery. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Back to your bike. Are there any specific... Um, bike setup tricks that you found for this more endurance style riding and tell us a bit about your cockpit and um, kind of like how do you make your bike comfortable to be on for that long? I'm very particular about my setup. I 
riding and racing is what I do professionally. And so this is my tool that I use every single day. And so for me, everything is down to the millimeter. And if it changes, I will know. Um, so I'm very particular about the fit in general. And then once I have that fit, it never really changes. So this is the same fit that I would race for a World Cup as I would for this long endurance style effort. And that's because I feel like it puts my body in the most comfortable position, but also the most optimized position to put out that power. And I think in many ways, those things have to be the same for a professional athlete. Nice, that's awesome intel. Yeah, so I've done a pretty full pull from the top to bottom trying to be pretty quick. And it is brutal on my hands, on my forearms, everything, and you're gonna be on a shorter travel bike. Tell us about what you're doing to mitigate maybe that, uh, what grips you're running, and uh, are you gonna use gloves? Yeah, I think the arm pump is gonna be real out there and the hand fatigue. So I'm gonna be running um, hand up the summer gloves, and then I'm gonna be running ESI Fit CR grips, which I really like that ergonomic design. It helps my hands stay a little bit less fatigued, and I really like the material that they use as well. So yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's gonna be hard no matter what, but that's what I'm doing to mitigate it as much as possible. Nice, and in terms of like, physical challenge. There's a lot of really technical parts of this trail. And like you said, you're climbing up the fire road, but you're descending like one of the gnarliest enduro trails in the world, um, especially in the United States. Are there any cruxes that you're nervous about, portions of the trail that you're like, you know, really gonna need to be tuned into? Yeah, well, I'm glad that you, that you clarified. I am riding up the fire road. I'm not gonna do the crazy up the actual single track. So I'll be climbing up the fire road, but then, like you said, down one of the gnarliest trails there are. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot of places that come to mind just off the bat. I think going down Bro Pass, it's extremely steep on so an steep XC bike and loose yeah and I think on an enduro bike that's pretty manageable I think on an XC bike that's going to feel really really steep so I think that initial shock to the system after climbing for so long and having that fresh fatigue of the climb is going to be really hard I have to mention the snotch everyone knows that that's going to be near impossible on something like this and then of course porcupine rim that's actually my favorite favorite part of the whole trail it's such but, a good section but how many hours in how much fatigue am I going to have totally. it's going to be a place that you really don't want to make a mistake and I'm going to have to be extra cautious and extra alert going into that one thing I was thinking of too is you'll have that like steep tech fast section right at the top of Burrow Pass you'll get into hazard and I feel like that's kind of flowier a little bit faster pace and then maybe UPS LPS that stuff will be really good on this bike I it's a little so. more open you can have good line choices and maybe not just be chundering for for, you know, the whole time down. I think so. I think the bike will be a really perfect for hazard, LPS, UPS. The only thing about that section is I think there's gonna be a tendency to think it's a little bit more mellow, mm -hmm. I can relax, I can ease up, mm -hmm. and that's when your mind Mistakes gets distracted happen. and you make a mistake. And there's some pretty consequential sections in there when you're tired. A couple of those corners are either you go left or you fall off a huge cliff. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to be aware even of making sure that I'm following the right trail the whole time. And, you know, making a mistake and crashing is one thing, but it's a very hard trail to then continue on if I am in a little pit of pain or mm -hmm. something like that. So it might even be worth it to ease up ever so slightly in order to not make a mistake. And conserve some energy for, like you said, Porcupine Rim, once it gets tighter single track at the bottom. There's some technical moves in there that are you'll need your full focus and energy for. So. Yeah, I like to call them those max power moves for sure. Yeah. yeah. So you're gonna hit the big whale drop on the left towards the bottom, the optional line? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the, how many optional off. lines I'll be taking out there. <laughs> Cool, so I think the only few things we haven't talked about is your shoe and pedal setup. Mm -hmm. um, and then also maybe like protection in terms of, I know a lot of people ride the whole enchilada with knee pads, obviously a helmet, uh, glasses. Do you wanna run us through the rest of the gear here that we haven't talked about yet? Totally. I debated shoes actually for a really long time because in an XCO style race, you're gonna run the lightest, most aggressive style shoe, but on this, attempt, it's so long, I'm going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to put a foot down. And so I ended up running, wanting to run the Jira Empire because I think that the bottom sole of the shoe is actually going to allow me a little bit of forgiveness when I do have to maybe potentially hop off my bike for a second if I make mm -hmm. a mistake. Um, and 
also it's still stiff is going to allow me to climb really well. Um, and then other than that, I'm going to run the Giro Helios helmet. Um, I think it's a great helmet. It's safe. It's going to be really light and allow me a lot of wind on the climb. But then obviously keeping the head safe on the descent. Totally. Accidents happen and it's a tough trail out there. Yeah. So staying safe is important. And then, of course, glasses as well. I'm going to run the Jolbo Fury glasses with a clear lens because I think that there's going to be a lot of different uh, darkness, light going back and forth out there. And I think mm -hmm. this is going to give me the clearest vision and also keep my eyes safe to the dust and rocks and everything else on the trail. Awesome. Uh, last question. What is one piece of gear that you that is most important for you on this attempt? Um, I think, honestly, I'm really excited about riding the Mach 4 SL, and I'm really excited in particular um, just about the way that it runs. So the DW link really allows it to not bob a lot in the climb, so I think it's just going to be the ultimate machine for this, because then also when I do unlock it, it has a lot of cushion, a lot more than you would expect on the descent. So I'm super excited to put this thing through the ultimate test, in my opinion. Sweet. Well, thanks for giving us all the details on your setup um, for your attempt at the FKT. Make sure you comment below and ask Hannah any questions. Subscribe so you can see the upcoming video. And uh, yeah, it's super nice to talk to you and good luck out there. Thanks. I can't wait. Cheers.